Logic is a language for reasoning. The word logic comes from the Greek term logos, which means word, but has deeper resonances of intelligibility and ordered thought. Logic is formally defined as the science which addresses the validity of inference and demonstration. The deeper understanding of logic is more nuanced, however, and reveals its enduring appeal to philosophers. Logic is principally interested in the principles of valid reasoning. It's interested in what, what makes an argument valid, for example. Um, so it's an attempt to explain in a systematic way as possible what the principles of valid reasoning are. When wielded by a skilled practitioner, logic is a potent tool for interrogating the world in which we live. Its goal, like that of philosophy as a whole, is to divine the truth of our conceptions of the world. To separate what is fact from what is fiction, the valid from the invalid, and sound arguments from fallacies, philosophical logic brings the rigor and clarity of mathematics to the language of philosophers. Today, what we mean by logic is actually a branch of mathematics. When philosophers talk about logic, they mean modern logic, which is sometimes called mathematical logic. It used to be called symbolic logic. Today, it's usually called mathematical logic, including uh, set theory, including uh, uh, the, th uh, the theory of computable functions, which is sometimes called, uh, which is the central part, the mathematical part of compu what's called computer science. As a tool for characterizing rational thought, logic crosses many philosophical boundaries, delving into metaphysics, epistemology, and philosophy of mind and language. It is a tool for working on basic notions like reference, predication, identity, truth, negation, quantification, existence, necessity, definition, and entailment. The origins of logic can be traced back to the works of Aristotle, who lived during the golden age of Greek culture in the fourth century BC. His thoughts on logic are spread across six works, including the prior analytics, the posterior analytics, categories, and on interpretation, which are collectively known as the organon. Aristotle wanted to establish rules that would enable Greek citizens to distinguish arguments that are formally valid and correct from those which are invalid and therefore wrong. Two fundamental principles of Aristotelian logic are the law of non-contradiction and the law of the excluded middle. The law of non-contradiction states that no proposition can be both true and false. And the law of the excluded middle says that a proposition must either be true or false. Aristotle designed his formal logic to be able to determine the validity of an argument regardless of the matter that's being argued. The engine of Aristotle's formal logic was the syllogism, a form of argument with two premises and a conclusion, such as, all men are mortal, Socrates is a man, Therefore, Socrates is mortal. Logic was, for a long time, dominated by, by Aristotle and, the, and, and his theory of the syllogism. He had uh, what we might, would now regard as a very simple view of what reasoning was like. So a typical example of reasoning for him would be all A's are B's, all B's are C's, therefore all A's are C's. A syllogism is discourse in which certain things being stated something other than what is stated follows of necessity from their being so. I mean by the last phrase that they produce the consequence, and by this that no further term is required from without in order to make the consequence necessary. In an Aristotelian syllogism, the conclusion is deduced from the premises. If we don't know that Socrates is mortal, then the fact that all men are mortal and that Socrates is a man can be offered as proof that he is indeed mortal. This is a deductive argument, meaning that the conclusion is a necessary consequence of the premises. 
The beauty of a successful deductive syllogism is that, properly executed, it cannot lead from true premises to false conclusions. Take this example. All trees are plants. All oaks are trees. All oaks are plants. We can formalize this argument by expressing it as All M's are P's. All S's are M's. Therefore, all S's are P's. This argument is formally valid, and its validity is completely independent of the truth of the statements that make it up. For example, take this highly questionable argument. All trees are angels. All birds are trees. Therefore, all birds are angels. Despite appearances, the form of this argument is indeed valid, even though its premises and conclusion are false. Likewise, an argument whose premises are false and conclusion is true can also be valid. All trees are flowers. All carnations are trees. Therefore, all carnations are flowers. The other primary form of logic is induction, which dictates how we can infer from observed events to generalizations we can rely on. Aristotle didn't only talk about deduction, he also talks about induction. Of course, he doesn't use the Latin word, but induction is a transla Latin translation of the Greek word he used. And he has a notion of induction. He doesn't have a satisfactory account, but he sees that science re requires both deductive knowledge and inductive knowledge. His example, for example, in one of, I think it's in the posterior analytics, is the learning that a substance is poisonous. A lot of people are dying. You have no idea why. And then suddenly the hypothesis occurs to you that it's because this thing that they're eating is poisonous. And he compares this, he uses a very graphic metaphors that change from the data looking chaotic to you, to you having this hypothesis. He compares to an army that's in retreat. And then he says, suddenly, one brave soldier stands up and says, no, stand with me. We can defeat these guys. And suddenly, they, they, they assume order, and they win the battle. Because it moves from the particular to the universal, an inductive argument can't guarantee that the truth of its premises will transfer to its conclusion. Consider the following example, where both the premises and the conclusion are true. This silver bar is metal and conducts electricity. This gold bar is metal and conducts electricity. This copper bar is metal and conducts electricity. We conclude inductively that all metals conduct electricity. If we find a deductive argument with true premises and a false conclusion, we declare that the form is invalid. But try this with an inductive argument and see what happens. This silver bar is metal and is solid. This gold bar is metal and is solid. This copper bar is metal and is solid. Therefore, all metal things are solid. The conclusion, of course, is false. Mercury is a metal that is also a liquid. Unlike a deductive argument, however, induction offered Aristotle no formal method of determining its validity. Therefore, Aristotle asserted that induction is not demonstrative and relegated it to secondary status. We may not proceed as by induction to establish a universal on the evidence of groups of particulars which offer no exception, because induction proves not what the essential nature of a thing is, but that it has or has not some attribute. Aristotle's logic, though foundational, was not by modern standards a robust system. Over time, it began to exhibit serious formal defects and an over-reliance on the deductive syllogism. The question remains, however, to what extent the weakness of his logic undermined his overall philosophical work. That even though Aristotle's log formal logic was, uh, I, should say, I should say his formal logic, his logic was, was impoverished, 
I, I don't think his th philosophical thinking was impoverished as a result. Many people think otherwise. They think that Aristotle committed all kinds of ghastly errors because of, of his logic. Uh, but it seems to me that a great thinker can rise above uh, his views about what, how the logic should go. I mean, even, you might, even if you have a view that this is how you should reason logically, you're going to reason however you think you should reason, regardless of your views about what it should, how it should go. One of the limitations in the Aristotelian system was in combining two propositions to give a third, more complicated proposition. The Stoic philosophers, who flourished in Athens beginning about 20 years after Aristotle's death, created a propositional logic that studied statements that are either true or false, called propositions, and went about determining whether or not the truth or falsehood of a sentence follows from those of a set of sentences, and if so, how. There are two types of logic that are fundamental to all other types. The logic of sentences, sentential or propositional logic, and the logic of objects, predicate logic. Sentential logic is interested only in true or false sentences, and does not go inside individual sentences to analyze or discuss their meanings. Predicate logic is a more powerful tool with additional inference rules that can accommodate variables and express equivalence among propositions like not all roses are red and some roses are not red. Predicate logic, of course, is the logic of predicates, but uh, equally significant about predicate logic is the apparatus of variables and quantifiers that it uses. It uses variables. The variable symbols like x, y, z, and quantifiers such as for some and for all. Predicate logic is usually stands in contrast to sentential logic, where we just have we treat a sentence as a unit. We don't actually analyze it. We have p, let's say, uh, to indicate a sentence. But in predicate logic, we break those sentences down into subject predicate form. <laughs> The Stoics' contribution to logic went virtually unnoticed for centuries. Medieval philosophers, such as Walter Burley, William Ockham, John Buridan, Albert of Saxony, and Paul of Venice, concentrated on shoring up Aristotelian logic and making incremental contributions of their own. However, the inexorable advance of science demanded new systems of thought, and the English philosopher Francis Bacon formulated a system that challenged the orthodoxy of Aristotle's organon. Bacon was quite immodestly presenting himself as giving a new organon, a new logic for interrogating the world. The old logic, the old logic was useful for presenting what it is that you already knew, but it was not useful for actually discovering new things. And what Bacon was attempting to do in the new organon is actually, um, is actually give us a method for interrogating the world that involved beginning by going out into the world, collecting facts, and collecting facts and organizing them into tables, and being able to draw theoretical conclusions from what it is that we organize into tables. What Bacon wanted to do was give us a rational way of organizing experience and interrogating nature so that with this combination of reason and experience, we could actually make progress. Now my method, though hard to practice, is easy to explain. And it is this. I propose to establish progressive stages of certainty. The evidence of the sense, helped and guarded by a certain process of correction, I retain. But the mental operation which follows the act of sense, I for the most part reject. And instead of it, I open and lay out a new and certain path for the mind to proceed in starting directly from the simple, sensuous perception. In the 19th century, philosophers began actively applying the structures of mathematics to logic. 
This mathematical turn marked the beginning of what we would recognize today as modern logic. Logic really exploded after 1854 when George Boole, a great British mathematician, also a very important contributor to the theory of differential equations and the creator of what's called the calculus of finite differences, uh, created something called the algebra of logic, sometimes called the algebra of classes, which is still an important piece. It's regards very elementary now, but it's still an important piece. And logic basically never stopped developing after 1854. Bull, a self-taught mathematician from a working-class background, expanded on the earlier work of the German philosopher Gottfried Leibniz to create the first algebra of logic. Bull discovered that the symbols of logic behaved just like those of algebra, and he used algebraic symbols to express hypothetical propositions such as, if A and B, then C and D, but A and B, then C and D. However, instead of dealing with the terms of the syllogism A, B, C and D, he believed it was more important to consider the truth of the propositions in general. Thus, if P is true, then Q will be true, where P and Q represent propositions. This argument would be taken up and improved by the mathematician Gottlob Frege, giving rise to modern propositional logic. The decisive breakthrough really came in the 19th century. And although various other people were seeing how what you can improve on, uh, on Aristotle, it was really Frege who made the decisive, decisive break and introduced the modern, the modern era of logic. So in terms of the great canon, I would say the, 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 two, the two principal figures would be Aristotle and Frege. Gottlob Frege was an obscure scholar in his own day, a mathematician who took it upon himself to demonstrate that the laws of arithmetic were ultimately reducible to logic, a position known as logicism. Along the way, he made the greatest single contribution to the study of logic in the history of the discipline. He was the first to identify the distinction between the logical axioms and rules which are necessary to make a deduction. He took the first steps towards making logic axiomatic. He created the propositional function, and he refined Aristotle's concept of quantification. The journey from Aristotle to the modern era was complete. Aristotle had a very simple view of what kind of statements would figure in logical reasoning. There were basically four forms, all A's are B's, no A's are B's, some A's are B's, and some A's are not B's. And what he did really was, basically he made an attempt, a pretty good, good attempt actually, I mean, a remarkable achievement, to figure out what are the valid um, inference patterns that you, there are, one can, uh, there are with, that involve these, these statements. Um, but the main problem with, with the logic is they have an impoverished view of what might be, what might be said. Um, if I say that every boy loves some girl, this cannot be fitted, this cannot be easily fitted into the kind of uh, statements that Aristotle considered. So Frege's great breakthrough was, to, was to, to see how to accommodate these statements, these other kinds of statements, in a systematic manner. Uh, and one of his great innovations was to be explicit about the use of variables in logic. So when you say every boy loves a girl, he would uh, have expressed this as for every x, if x is a boy, then there is a y such that y is a girl, and x loves y. So he introduced this apparatus of variables and so-called quantifies some and all, um, which enabled him then to express a much wider variety of statements uh, and to give a much more inclusive account of what logical reasoning might be. Thanks to Boole and Frege, philosophers were able to develop a precise notation for logical analysis. According to Aristotelian logic, in any given argument, 
the truth of its conclusion is implied in the truth of its premises. Therefore, we can turn any argument into a conditional in the if-then form. If the premises are true, then the conclusion will also be true. This can be symbolized as follows. P represents the premises in conjunction. Q the conclusion, and the symbol in between represents the relationship between them. For example, the assertion, if I run, then I get tired, may be symbolized this way. Here, the antecedent, if I run, is a sufficient but not necessary condition for the consequent, then I get tired, to take place. It is enough for me to run to get tired, but it's not necessary because I can get tired in many other ways. A sufficient condition is one that, if true, requires that the consequences also be true. However, this does not work the other way around. The consequent may be true and the antecedent false without affecting the truth value of the conditional. This kind of analysis is at the core of contemporary philosophy. Frege's monumental work, The Foundations of Arithmetic, profoundly influenced the English philosopher Bertrand Russell. His Principia Mathematica, written with his mentor, Alfred North Whitehead, owed a tremendous debt to Frege's pioneering work. Next to Aristotle's Organon, Principia Mathematica is undoubtedly the most influential book on logic ever written. In it, Russell took up the development of logicism that Frege had set in motion. Frege becomes really terribly important because he anticipated the reduction, and there's a question whether it really is a reduction, but the reduction of mathematics to symbolic logic. There was a fall of there was a flaw in his reduction in his system. Russell wrote him a famous letter pointing out that the paradox called the Russell paradox could be derived in Frege's system and was actually inconsistent, which called Frege basically to give up. Russell formulated the paradox he found in Frege's logic as follows. The set of all sets that are not members of themselves is a member of itself if and only if it is not a member of itself. Russell's paradox, as his critique of Frege came to be known, is one of the many dilemmas, fallacies, and paradoxes that test the mettle of logicians. Among the best known is the infamous liar paradox, which has captivated philosophers ever since Epimenides of Creek declared, his tongue firmly in cheek, that all Cretans are liars. The liar paradox, uh, in its ancient form, is uh, imagine that someone's, this is not actually the most ancient Greek form, but the, the consider, suppose I write on a sh sheet of paper the sentence, the, and, and I, just one sentence, the only sentence on this sheet of paper is false, or alternative, the, the one and only sentence on this sheet of paper is not true. And you ask, well, is that sentence, is the only sentence on that sheet of paper true? Well, if it's true, it's not true, because that's what it says. Therefore, by uh, proof by contradiction, we conclude that it's not true. So the only sentence on that Peter, but that's the only sentence on that Peter paper. So, <laughs> it's true. Vicious circles arise from supposing that a collection of objects may contain members which can only be defined by means of the collection as a whole. Bertrand Russell's approach to language was taken up by the Polish logician Alfred Tarski, the founder of semantic logic. His most important contribution is generally considered to be his work on the semantic theory of truth. What Tarski did was show that if you have a formalized lang notation, for example, a formal, uh, formalized language like the formalized language that Russell and White had created in which you can state all of like, modern mathematics, up to and including uh, Weil's proof of the Fermat theorem. 
uh, and or if you have a uh, formalized language of the kind computer scientists create. And the philosophical significance of what he did is going to be discussed for a long time. Uh, one thing he noticed was that you can say that a sentence is true without using the word true. Just repeat the sentence. <laughs> if you want to say that snow is white, it's true. You don't have to use the word true. Just say snow is white. Uh, but so what, what do we need the word true for? People have not been aware that the language about which we speak need by no means coincide with the language in which we speak. They have carried out the semantics of a language in that language itself and, generally speaking, they have proceeded as though there was only one language in the world. The German mathematician David Hilbert was an avid student of the Principia Mathematica, and in the early 1920s, he formulated a proposal for formalizing mathematics in axiomatic form. This proposal came to be known as Hilbert's program and brought logic into the realm of language. Logic took a linguistic turn, uh, not so much with Frege, I think, but we're really with Hilbert, um, who had a particular program in the philosophy of mathematics. Uh, uh, this program required that he prove mathematics was consistent. So he then actually had to treat mathematics itself as a mathematical object. Okay. So the tension now was not the focus now was not on the objects of mathematics, but on the symbols of mathematics. Uh, this was something that's called metamathematics. And logic really took off from that. This, so the, a large part of logic dealt not with the actual things themselves, which you're talking about, but with, with the actual language by which you might talk about them. Um, and so whereas I think that approach might have been somewhat foreign to, to, to Frege, and Russell, and I think sometimes they weren't even clear as to whether they were talking about what it is that language represents or the language itself. Hilbert's program was to exert a defining influence on the Czech mathematician and logician Kurt Gödel, who argued that all logical systems are essentially incomplete. As mathematics moved farther away from the traditional Euclidean view, mathematicians sought new ways to ferret out possible internal inconsistencies in their work. They wanted to see if, for a proven theorem, they could rule out the possibility that an opposite theorem could be proven to be true as well, rendering their system meaningless. This required that they be able to guarantee the completeness of their systems, meaning that there would be a way to prove or disprove it. This might prove difficult for a particular theorem, but mathematicians were confident that it was true in principle. Gödel's point is this is the liar paradox, unless it's the case that it doesn't have to be that either a statement is provable or its negation is provable. So that's because provability is not the same as truth, <laughs> that we escape the lie, that he hasn't succeeded in producing a liar paradox, which would be bad if he had, because unlike Russell's paradox, which takes a very strong set theory, as we now know, a too strong set theory to develop in, the Gödel theorem is, is really a theorem in elementary arithmetic, <laughs> in elementary number theory. So it would show the whole elementary theory of numbers is inconsistent if it had been a, a contradiction. You might say it's almost like chick, a game of chicken. You're trying to, it's as if Gödel were trying to see how close he could come <laughs> to showing even the most elementary part of mathematics inconsistent. And instead of hitting the wall or hitting the other car, he <laughs> produced this wonderfully paradox. And again, philosophers will go on discussing the significance of this uh, forever and ever. Gödel proved that in a formal axiomatic system, you simply can't have both consistency and completeness. Either you can't prove everything within a particular system, or you couldn't guarantee that there could not be any contradictions. For mathematicians, there was no more having their cake and eating it too. After Russell, I think Gödel is the most significant 
figure. Uh, principally, though, not only because of his great uh, results in metamathematics, his results about the limitations of formal systems. He showed the system of mathematics that's capable of talking in a reasonable way about, about numbers. Um, then, if it's consistent, this is something that can't be proved uh, within the system. And he also showed that if it's consistent, then there are going to be uh, statements within the system that can't, can't actually be settled one way or the other. One cannot claim with certainty of any formal system that all conceptual considerations are representable in it. Gödel was a frequent visitor to a group of thinkers who gathered in Vienna to discuss philosophy. This group, known as the Vienna Circle, consisted of Moritz Schlick, Rudolf Carnap, Otto Neurath, and many others. They were inspired by the rapid advancements in science and logic, and initiated a movement called Logical Positivism. The positivist view was that a statement about the world could be meaningful if and only if it is either empirically verifiable or it can be shown to be true through logical analysis of its signs or symbols. Logic had taken center stage in the philosophical debate. As logic evolved in the 20th century, one area where it had tremendous impact is in the development of computer science. George Boole had expressed statements using a binary code consisting of ones and zeros that would be familiar to any contemporary programmer. A Turing machine is the abstract representation of how a computer works and is named for the British mathematical logician Alan Turing. The Turing machine is uh, an invention of Turing which has tried to just formalize the idea of a computer. It's really the idea of a mechanical procedure which will eventuate in a, in a result. So it, all the Turing machine really means is just a set of explicit instructions usually nowadays called an algorithm, which will put a problem in and will crank out a result without the necessity for any kind of human understanding or invention or creativity. And that's what a computer does. It, it, it's just a simple set of mechanical rules. So a Turing figured out a way to make a machine that does that. It involves a tape which moves around and erases things. So it's just the idea of a computer. A Turing machine is just a computer. It's an algorithmic symbol manipulating a completely mechanical system. One area of logic that has intrigued philosophers for centuries is inductive reasoning, which dictates how we infer general rules from observed events. Because it didn't offer the logical certainty of deduction, Aristotle was deeply suspicious of inductive reasoning, a suspicion shared by many later philosophers. Induction really didn't play a big role because of Aristotle's mistaken idea that induction is kind of a temporary crutch. That when you figured out what's going on, you can eventually find what are called a priori, certain intuitive principles from which you can do it by deduction. That mistake cost us dearly because it was not really until Francis Bacon and his generation that the idea, no, you can't do science by a priori methods, you have to use induction. Induction isn't just a temporary thing, it isn't something that's to be superseded by apodictic insight. It's, uh, it's essential. The importance of induction to science, in which hypotheses are supported by an accumulation of evidence, prompted many philosophers to attempt to pinpoint its place, if any, in valid reasoning. The Austrian philosopher Karl Popper believed that in everyday life we use a method of trial and error that might look like induction, but whose logical structure was completely different. Peter Strassen argued that induction wasn't obliged to mimic deduction in order to be valid. There is an inherent uniformity to nature that validates the conclusions of inductive reasoning. The American philosopher Nelson Goodman believed that you couldn't create a formal system of inductive logic because for every hypothesis confirmed by evidence, 
there were an infinite number of alternative hypotheses, which are also confirmed by that evidence. Bayesian confirmation theory, named for the 18th century English mathematician Thomas Bayes, supports an inductive logic founded on statistical probability by combining common sense knowledge with observational evidence. As logic's influence in philosophy has grown, so have the number of systems that have been developed to address different areas or types of inquiry. Extensional logic was created to make statements about objects, relations between objects, and about the relations themselves. Modal logic introduces the operators necessary and possible, but without taking into account the existence or non-existence of that which is necessary or possible. The American philosopher C.I. Lewis initiated the modern analysis of modality with the publication of his book, Survey of Symbolic Logic, in 1918. I think there's a sort of definite modern movement um, that began uh, actually with Lewis at the beginning of the last century and continues to the present day. Modal logic is, has really become a very important part not only of, of philosophy but of uh, computer science and of linguistics. Um, whole movements in linguistics have been founded upon a modal logic. Um, very important approaches to um, uh, discussing the behavior of programs uh, are also based upon modal logic. Uh, basic issues in the philosophy of time are discussed with the help of modal logics. So it's, it's, a, it's a branch of logic that's had a very pervasive influence both inside and outside of philosophy. Deontic logic brings the operators ought and can into the logician's lexicon introducing a new kind of language into the philosophical discussion of ethics. Deontic logic parses out issues of duty and attempts to make sense of propositions such as it is obligatory that, it is permitted that, or it is forbidden that. Epistemic logic, as its name implies, tackles the epistemological issues inherent in statements like Tom knows, Sally assumes, or I believe. Deviant logic rejects the principle of the excluded middle, which had since the time of Aristotle ruled out any possible middle ground between truth and falsehood. Deviant logic encompasses multi-valued, universal, and fuzzy logics. Multi-valued logic accepts more than two truth values whereas universal logic aims at constructing valid systems for every possible world. Fuzzy logic allows for an infinite number of truth values and is a useful tool in areas like economics, where decisions must be made in an environment of pervasive uncertainty. The ongoing dialogue between logic and philosophy has a long and sometimes rancorous history. One critical issue is where logic should place its emphasis, on formalism and rigor, or on semantic content. After Hilbert, uh, it became very common um, to, to actually uh, start talking about the language itself. Um, uh, so a great deal of logic now is just the study of symbolisms. I myself think it's not altogether a good thing. Um, I think we sort of lost a certain sort of innocence that Frege and Russell had, which it might be, might be good for us to restore. Because uh, we're primarily interested not in the language, but what it, what it represents. And so why not just talk directly about that uh, rather than the language? So I'm not against these, these uh, linguistically oriented uh, inquiries. It's just that I think that something may have been missed out in, do, in, in, in focusing so exclusively on on, on, on that side of things. A daunting system of arcane rules and symbols to some, a beacon of clarity and order to others. Logic might be more accurately thought of as a tremendously versatile tool. 
that is constantly being used even as it's still in the process of being made. Perhaps Lewis Carroll captured the nature of logic best when he wrote, If it was so, it might be. And if it were so, it would be. But as it isn't, it ain't. That's logic. Thank you.